luck to everyone. Have fun. All right, so we're going to get right to the questions then. And uh, there are a lot of questions here. So uh, because I haven't done this video in so long, uh, I will may go a little longer. Well, actually, my videos are always <laughs> 45 minutes an hour long, it seems to be. Uh, I don't like editing videos, especially when I'm sharpening things, because uh, there are times when, as you guys know yourselves, if you guys, if you guys are watching things like a cooking show and, and they, you know, they say, oh, then just cook until the meat turns brown. And all of a sudden, 20 seconds later, it's brown. And when you try, it's like not brown 20 seconds later. Uh, so I don't like editing videos. Uh, if you guys don't like it, just jump to the very end and find the conclusions for yourself. But this is a Q&A. So if you guys don't appreciate listening to other people's questions and me answering them, then just hit the stop button and go watch something else that's uh, you know more suited for your time at this point. But uh, these are questions or questions I think are very important or some of them are very important. And uh, yeah, so so the first, uh, first question is, uh, or uh, this is actually a number of questions <laughs> from a lot of different people, and it really pertains to my 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 bracelet. So the question is, uh, what is that pouch on your pouch thing on your wrist by Wander uh, Van Van Hoke? I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, Jay Lane, same thing. Weird question, but what is that bracelet thing uh, by David Faulkner? Where did you get that bracelet? I want to buy one. And we also have one by Charles Gearman. Uh, where did you get your bracelet? Uh, this bracelet seems, uh, seems to be getting a lot of attention because I wear it all the time. Let's put that, thing, put that down. So this bracelet here is actually a, it's a custom bracelet made by my wife uh, at the time was my girlfriend. So the backstory of this bracelet was, it's actually a Venezuelan bracelet. So I don't know, I think back in 2008, I want to say 2008, my wife and I, we were actually dating at the time and she actually moved to Venezuela for two years. And uh, yeah, so during that time, we actually were still dating. We did long distance for about two years while she lived in Venezuela and I was living in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And then when she moved back from Venezuela, uh, she actually went to San Francisco or to the Bay Area to study for another year while I lived in Los Angeles. So in total time, we actually did long, uh, long distance for three years. But the bracelet was a, it's a French bracelet from Venezuela. Normally they're only about an inch thick or like three quarters of an inch thick at the absolute most. When she was making one for me, I said, would you be, you know, would you be interested in making me one? Or would you be interested? In, would it be possible if you made me a bracelet that was about two and a half uh, inches thick? And or wide and she said that's gonna take a very long time and it did it took her about a whole month and it took her about 60 hours uh, before completion and so she made this from waxed uh, wax string yeah wax string and it's a uh, black and pink it's very I mean I love this thing I have um, I've only taken it off about two to three times in my uh, since I've owned it I've owned it for now I want to say I've had it for on my wrist now for seven going on to eight years I took it off once when my first daughter was born because, you know, being in the hospital, I wasn't sure if this was carrying uh, any sort of like germs that could get her sick as a newborn. And I took it off the second time, uh, two, three months ago when my twins were born. So I've only taken it off twice and I may have taken it off a couple other times when I was putting on some suits uh, for work and I had to uh, make sure that I wasn't wearing anything other than, uh, you know, a nice watch or something like that. But yeah, so this bracelet was made by my wife. It's a custom made bracelet. You can't buy this anywhere. So I'm sorry guys, for those who actually want this bracelet, I can't sell it to you. It's not for sale. Um, but I do have some contacts in Venezuela. Then they actually, you know, if you guys aren't aware, Venezuela is going through some really hard times right now. And a couple of my friends have reached out to me and they said, hey, you know, uh, are there any opportunities that we have to earn money on the internet? Do you, do you guys know of anything? I haven't, you know, I haven't approached anyone about this yet, but if you guys want to, I can reach out to them and say, hey, would you guys make me some bracelets? Maybe send me like 10 bracelets or 20 bracelets a month. And I'll just put it onto my perfection site. And you guys, if you guys want it, you guys can pick it up for, I don't know, 10, 20 bucks each, uh, you know, very affordable. But uh, there, I mean, I don't really know if that's even something I can do because uh, I know that mail in and out of Venezuela is really difficult to secure. And so I really don't know how, if, uh, I really can't guarantee that if you guys want bracelets, I can actually even get them to you. But I'll reach out to them. If uh, if you guys leave a comment, let me know if you guys want bracelets like this. Um, I can even ask them to make them thicker bracelets as well. And so the prices may be higher. They may be 50 bucks, 60 bucks. But they take, like I said, uh, this one took 60 hours to complete. So if you guys are interested in something like that, just let me know in the comments and I will definitely 
reach out to you and if they say I'll reach out I definitely will reach out to them and if they say yes they can make bracelets this thick and uh, I will then post a video probably in about two months or so letting you guys know the update and what I can do for you cool so that's the story of the bracelet uh, it's a bracelet one qu one comment I actually couldn't, couldn't find was one one of my uh, I don't know if, if, if that person was being serious was uh, does a bracelet help you balance while you're sharpening <laughs> I wanted to write back and say yes it does I think I did I think I, I replied and said yes it helps me balance and everyone who sharpens a knife needs to have a bracelet like this but no it's just a bracelet it's just a bracelet that I love that my wife made and um, that's really it so the next question pertains to the brick uh, so the big so the big question is what grit do you believe the brick uh, to be is that brick closer to 800 uh, stone to a to a 800 stone or a 1000 stone uh, as you guys know i sharpened on my trusty brick i don't know where it is it's hiding somewhere oh here it is ah okay so this is the brick that i successfully sharpened a kuma chef knife on um so just so you guys know though the kuma is is, is a fairly sh soft knife it's not rated any of anything, I don't even, it's probably rated at a 52, 53, maybe a 54 on the Rockwell scale. Um, so I will attempt a sharpening with some other high-end knives. I actually am curious to see if this brick can sharpen a 62, 63 uh, Rockwell Dow Strong, maybe even a Kramer on this thing. I don't know. <laughs> I might get a, a, like a, a lawsuit letter from Kramer or from Zwilling if I run their, their knife on this brick. But I'm actually quite curious to see if this brick can handle uh, higher end knives. But in terms of a grit, I really think it's probably closer to a 1500 to maybe even a 2000 grit. Uh, if you guys actually watched that video, the cut was extremely smooth. And so I'm actually quite surprised. And I am, I actually am curious as to, to, you know, what is that grit number as well. So I'll find out. Uh, I can't do it scientifically. I'm sure there's a microscope that I can probably look under and just tell you. But I will do a series where I sharpen the brick next to a 1000 grit uh, diamond and 1000 grit Tracera, 1000 grit um, Shopton Pro, Shopton Glass, and then maybe even go a little higher to see if the cut quality is the same on all those knives. But it'll be a fun little series. I'll do it at some point. Uh, so I will report back to you. Uh, Mu Fu Shu. Okay, so Mu Fu Shu, hang tight. I will get that video for you at some point. All right, so this is uh, by MT. Hey, I was wondering if a budget, if on a budget, uh, what would you, pr sorry guys, I really can't see that well right now. I have a, a sty in my eye, so I have I have sty medication in my eye right now and I, I literally cannot see out of like my left eye. It's like completely blurry and so everything kind of looks really weird right now. Uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but uh, yeah, I got the, Maybe it's because I've got like three kids around and they're always grabbing my face. And so I got a little sty in my eye. And so, all right. I was wondering if on a budget, uh, would you, what would you prefer? A more expensive knife or uh, and cheaper stone or cheaper knife and more expensive stone? Uh, for me, obviously, I would go for the more expensive knife and then the cheaper budget stone. Uh, I definitely would choose the best knife I can afford. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, because you guys will, for the most part, you will only sharpen your knife once, I mean, once a week, once or every two months, uh, you know. So I would, I would say go go spend your money and invest that money in the best knife you can buy because you're going to be you're going to be using your knife an hour a day, two hours a day or more if you guys are a, a prep cook or a line chef or something like that. So, yeah, I would say definitely spend more money on your knife and then the stone. I'm, I mean, I can get a knife sharpened on a brick. So <laughs> you guys don't need to buy expensive stones, okay? Uh, I've also achieved a pretty good edge on some sandpaper, some local uh, papers bought at the local hardware store. Um, you can also buy budget options like, uh, I mean, if you can go with a really budget option, you can get with, uh, go with a, a, uh, let me grab a stone here. Okay, so here are some budget options for you if you really wanted to get a stone with a decent knife. Uh, so here's the King. Uh, this is this is the KW65. I believe the retail price is 25 bucks on Amazon right now, or maybe even a little less. Good stone. It's stone that is definitely recommended and uh, will work really well. Uh, this is the Whetstone Cutlery. This is the 400-1000 stone. I really like this stone. Uh, this stone here 
is probably one of the better, if not the, I don't want to say the best, but definitely one of the better 400, 1000 grit stones I have used. Uh, very responsive. It's hard and it doesn't dish or, or cave in really easily or gully very quickly. Definitely a stone I really recommend. Uh, I would actually even say that the this stone here may be better for you than the KW King uh, King KW65 because if you are a new person to sharpening, you don't really need a 6,000 grit polishing stone. It's nice to have for the future or for future uses, but you really want to hone your technique on the 1,000 grit level, and that's really where you get most of your performance. Uh, anything above the 1,000, you're polishing your knife, and if you don't have a good sharpening technique at the 1,000 grit level, it doesn't matter what grit you throw at it after that. If you don't have a good edge at the 1,000 level, you're not going to get a good edge if you throw a 6,000 grit stone on it. So that's why I recommend people getting one simple stone, a 1,000 grit stone, or an 800 grit stone, and really just honing your technique that way, and then worrying about polishing and stropping later on. Uh, this here is the Sharp Pebble. This is the 1,000-6,000. So this here is a direct competitor to the King. It's a little bit more harder than the King. Uh, the 1,000 side, does not. it's harder on the 1,000 side. It doesn't feel as responsive. I mean, it doesn't feel as organic as the 1,000 grit side, but it's definitely a harder stone. It has a little bit better feedback, and on the 6,000 side, it will give you not quite the mirror polish of the 6,000 side, but it gives you a more responsive 6,000 grit uh, sharpening session or polishing session. So also a good stone. I think this one here is about, I want to say about 30 bucks. So it's a little bit more expensive than the King, but definitely a decent stone. Uh, this one here is a sharp pebble. Uh, uh, sharp pebble also, yeah, this is also sharp pebble 400, 1000. So these two stones are pretty much identical. They are, <laughs> I didn't know they were identical when I bought them. I thought they were actually very different stones. Uh, these two stones are the same stones and they are, just rebranded. So the Sharp Pebble 401,000 and the Whetstone Cutlery 401,000, in my opinion, are the same stones. Uh, they may say they're different stones, but I'm pretty positive uh, sharpening with them. They are the same stones. So I'll put them together here. But if you bought this combination here, uh, these these two stones, I believe, are like 10 to $12. So very, very affordable. Uh, the King is about, like I said, mid-20s, and the Sharp Pebble is in the $30 range. But any of these stones, and you couple it with a good leather strop, um, these, uh, actually, ma I made the strop, and it works really, really well. I bought the most uh, high-quality leather I can find with a hardwood base. Uh, I bought maple, cherry, and walnut just to see what the bases are like. And I put a really thick leather uh, layer of leather on the other side to keep it from slipping. Um, you can also put uh, polishing compound on this, or stropping compound on this. But... Something like this and these here will cost you no more than 40 bucks. And this combination right here, or these two combinations right here, will give you just as good a result as any Chocera, any, you know, Chapman Pro, Chapman Glass, Whetstone you can buy. And I will do a series on that showing you guys a complete set of stones that you can get, buy for 30, 40 bucks versus a $300 set. And I will sharpen the exact same knives side by side and you guys will really see the results and it will shock you how good uh, of a result you can get with really budget items. So I will leave uh, links to all these items here in the description if you guys are interested in checking them out. The I have a few of these left. I have about a dozen of these left. Uh, again, I made these just as a, as a kind of little DIY project here for myself uh, because I'm gonna do a series on stropping. So that's why I made them. And whenever I, I, I make stuff for my shop, I always make uh, large quantities of it because at the end, the prices aren't that much more, but I get better value of it. And also I can use them to give people, you know, to give uh, stuff away. And also for those who want some that you guys really don't want to pay 60 bucks, 70 bucks for a good leather strop. Um, these cost me a little less than a little less than what I'm selling them for. I'm selling them from between 28 to $32. And uh, yeah, so they're really good, uh, really good leather strops for that. But to answer your question, yes, I would recommend you getting the best knife you can afford and then just going with a cheap $10 stone. And if you want to bring that up a notch, go pick up a, another st a leather strop with some polishing compound and you will be good to go. Cool. All right. So we have next question is diamonds, uh, diamond stone question. So, um, okay. So this is by Richard C and I'll, I'll skip the first part. So a uh, question, initially, are you pressing down on the Atoma 
just as hard as you would press on a water stone on the of the same grit. Uh, I've read too many, yeah, too many times not to press too hard on diamond stones because the diamonds will be dislodged. Hmm. Okay, uh, is there something you need to uh, be conscious of with the atoma stones? Okay, so let me grab an atoma stone just so we have uh, something to reference as we're talking. Okay, so this is the Atoma. Uh, this is the 400 and 1000, and uh, this is my, the 400 has really become my workhorse here in the shop. I have never seen a diamond, or at least I've never looked at this thing under a mic microscope to see if a diamond has popped out. But looking at it and just going through it with my hands, I have, I don't see any inconsistencies on the surface. I don't press hard on the stone when I'm flattening it, um, if I do flatten the stone. Um, I really allow the stone's weight or the plate's weight to do the work for me. I may apply a, pr a pound of pressure or two just to make sure that I have the stone very level because uh, sometimes if you're if you're flattening a very dish stone, you want to make sure that you have enough pressure so that the, the dishing doesn't affect the actual plate itself. Uh, so you really only want to apply a, a pound or two of pressure if you flatten your stone. And if you do it often, if you do it once every week or once every two weeks, it shouldn't take you longer than 30, 40 seconds of, uh, of running the, uh, the plate on top of the stone to get it flattened. So uh, so no, I don't apply any pressure, really an, any unnecessary pressure on the plate. And to respond about the diamonds falling off, I have never seen that. Uh, I have flattened, oh man, by, by this point, <laughs> I don't know how many stones I've flattened here. I probably have flattened 50, 60 stones at this point, maybe more. Uh, I've never seen any of my diamonds uh, become dislodged. And the way you would tell is, as you're actually flattening the stone, sometimes if a diamond does pop off, it normally doesn't just pop off and roll onto the water. It normally will pop off and stick onto the surface of the whetstone, and you get, will, you'll see these big grinding marks on the whetstone. And that's usually when you know how you, if there's like debris, if there's sand on the whetstone that needs to be removed. Uh, but no, I've never seen that on any of my stones. So I'm sure it could happen, uh, like anything. I, I never say never, and uh, I just haven't had that happen with my Atoma plates yet. So as long as you're gentle with it and you're not abusing the plate, I don't think that you will have a problem with diamonds falling off. All right. Okay, so this is by uh, Tommy 4 kkkk Yeah, is that Tome or is that Tommy? Or is that Tome? Anyway, it's Tome. I'll say Tome 4 kkkk All right. Uh, what grit progression do you recommend? I plan to buy one extra water stone to complement my 1,000, 3,000 Cerex water stones. Uh, very nice. Good on you for that. Is 8,000 fine if I use the 3,000 with slurry? So basically the question is, from a 3,000 grit stone to an 8,000 grit stone, is that a problem? No. As a matter of fact, a lot of folks will go from a 1,000 grit stone to an 8,000 grit Kitayama, for example. Uh, so no, you have uh, absolutely nothing to worry about to go from a 1,000 to 3,000 to 8,000. As a matter of fact, you're probably just cutting that time uh, that it takes to remove the scratches from the 1,000 side on the 8,000 grit stone. And so, yeah, so no, there's no issues with that. Uh, there, a, a, lot, a lot of folks will actually will go from a 1,000 to even a 10,000 grit stone. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that too. So when you cut that grit, when you go from a step from a 1,000, 3,000, or 1,000, 6,000 to a 10,000 or an 8,000, you are hopefully just, you're diminishing the time required to remove the scratches from the lower grit stone. But there is no issues going from 1,000 to 8,000, 1,000 to 10,000, okay? It all comes down to time. So if you guys have time to, or you don't wanna, if you don't want to invest the time to wait for the higher grit stone to remove the grit, of the scratches on the 1000 grit stone, add a stone in between. And that's really what it comes down to. And budget, right? So uh, I use the Trocero 3000 as my personal polishing stone. I don't really go anything about yeah, beyond that. Uh, I think that 3000 for me is like the, one of the best stones I can buy. Uh, it gives you a really good semi mirror polish, but it also gives you an amazing edge. Um, and I like Kasumi finishes. I really don't like high gloss mirror polishes. I think that sometimes can look a little bit cheap, uh, but that's that's just my opinion. So yeah, so you definitely don't need to go, uh, and uh, you don't you definitely don't have to worry about going from a three thousand to eight thousand with or without slurry. 
All right, so this is a question between uh, honing and stropping. So this is uh, Arturo Barreto. Uh, so what is the difference between using a honing steel and stropping? Uh, there is a very big difference. So let me grab a, hmm, if I can find my honing rod somewhere. Uh, okay. The uh, problem is I'm moving my studio a lot and things just kind of fly and move around without me knowing. So let me, uh, let me find that rod somewhere. Oh, here it is. All right. So this is a, a ceramic honing rod and this is a leather strop. So let's just move these aside and we'll talk this way. Okay, so a, let me just talk about the honing rod first and then we'll hop into the leather strop. And then, uh, so in my opinion, this is what I find. Um, honing rods are generally good if you have a knife that produces a lot of burr uh, as you're using it or the burr or the tips can tend to be, or the cutting edge tends to be a little bit softer. Uh, if you're using a Japanese knife with a heat treatment of, let's say, 60 and above, um, the chances of that knife de uh, developing a burr while you're using it on a day-to-day -day basis is actually m minimal relative to, let's say, a Wusthof or a Zwilling that has a heat treatment of 55 to 58. Uh, those knives tend to be a little bit softer, and so their cutting edge tends to roll a little bit easier, and that's when you throw the knife onto a, a honing rod or a honing steel. Uh, whether it be ceramic or titanium or steel. And so you're just realigning those teeth, right? That, that the teeth on the cutting edge. And so these, uh, these will tend to, they tend to work better when you have large materials to remove or to realign, okay? That's really the difference between that and a strop. A strop you typically wanna use when you have a cutting edge that is very sharp, uh, that has come off a sharpening stone session. And let's say you've just finished on an eighth you know, 6,000, 8,000 grit stone, and you simply want to pull off any micro debris from that cutting edge, and you throw it into a leather strop, uh, either with or without compound. And so you are basically polishing the polish. Okay, so that's a little bit different than realigning your teeth. When you're realigning teeth, you're pulling off uh, large materials, and you actually are making those, those that teeth uh, on the cutting edge straight. On the strop, you are not removing, uh, you're not re realigning anything everything should be realigned and straight already. You're basically just pulling off that, uh, polishing off that edge and making it cleaner. And so if you were to take a wust off uh, that you have been using for a week, let's say, and the, and the edge, you can definitely feel that there's a lot of uh, bent teeth on it and you throw it into a strop, uh, you will not, it will take you, I mean, you probably can get that edge clean enough to actually use, but it will take you a long time. So. So the answer is yes, you can. Uh, you, you know, you can use a well-used knife uh, on a strop on a day-to-day -day basis, but it just takes you a long time. So that's really the difference: is you are using the steel, uh, whether it be a ceramic or a steel or a titanium rod, to realign teeth. Versus, and you are taking off some material because you will see materials uh, be embedded onto the surface of your rod. So it does take off material, don't get me wrong. It just takes off larger chunks of material versus a strop where you're taking off very, very minimal material, uh, microscopic amounts of material, and you are not really trying to realign anything uh, except polish that cutting edge and just to pull off any micro, uh, micro like I said, uh, microscopic material that's on the cutting edge. Okay, so that's really the difference is one is for daily use, one is for, I would say, weekly use uh, after a sharpening session. And that's, again, these are just my opinions. Uh, I can be completely wrong. And you know, this is, this, this, there's no one way of doing anything. Uh, if you guys have found that using a strop on a daily basis is fine for you, then that's great. Or if you find that using a honing rod once a week is fine for you, that's great as well. So, you know, there's never a, uh, nobody has the say in terms of how to take care of your knives. Um, these are just methods that I have used uh, that, that I have, I'm sharing with you. So that's, that's really my experience there, okay? Okay, so uh, this is by Dima Communication. Uh, hey man, I don't want to sound in inappropriate, but what's your job? I mean, you have like 5,000 in stones, uh, smiling tears, cries. So, 
uh, I don't know how much money I have in stones. Uh, probably, yeah. I mean, if you were to count and break it all down, I may have uh, $5,000 in stones. Uh, I have the, pretty much the, the complete collection of Tresera's Super Stones and the Shopton Glass and Shopton Pros. So, yeah, there may be $5,000 in stones there. Uh, I'm a full-time dad. So, just so you guys know, I am a full-time dad. That is my first and foremost most important job uh, right now. So uh, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I worry about uh, and think about is my daughter, my oh, my three kids now, and my wife. And the last thing I worry about is them as well. Uh, during the day, when I have time, I will go out and make these videos. When I have when I have time, I don't really have that much time. I have about one or two days a week uh, and about one or two hours a day. So I'll have about maybe three to four hours a, day, a week that I can invest in making, uh, filming, and editing my videos. So that is my full-time career. Uh, before that, if you guys are curious, I was working for uh, Subaru, Volkswagen, and Audi doing auto show work. So I would travel from city to city. Uh, I would live in a hotel for about 46 months of the year, and I would go to auto shows, and I would be one of those guys on the stage with a microphone or a yeah some sort of speaker system and talk to you about cars. Uh, I'll be the guy that is answering questions for you when you guys go to the auto shows and you want to know, hey, what is the difference between an Audi and a Subaru? I'll be the guy that uh, answers that question for you. So yeah, so that's what I did for about, uh, oh my goodness. I did that for, I wanna say 11 years or so. And uh, two years ago when my first daughter was born, I thought it was time to stop. Uh, living life on the road is fun and great when you are a bachelor but when you're married and now that you have a family uh, I couldn't afford the time uh, I, I couldn't afford the uh, yeah time to go away from my family and so and so my wife and I you know we've structured our lives in a way where we are able to have me stay at home and she is a teacher and so that's what I do I'm a full-time dad and uh, I do YouTube videos on my spare time all right so this one is by uh, David uh, Scheidler. Did I say that right? Uh, okay, uh, so I would be interested in a video where you introduce yourself a bit. Uh, tell us about how you became interested in knives and sharpening. Uh, do you have any professional experience that is relevant, such as uh, work in a restaurant kitchen? Uh, what inspired you to start making sharpening videos for YouTube? I enjoy uh, the content you create. Keep up the great work. Uh, thank you, David, for watching my videos. Okay, so let's go down a bit. So uh, about me, I am, a, again, I'm a full-time dad and a part-time YouTuber. Um, I became interested in knives uh, since a very young age. Uh, so my first experience with sharp knives is watching my father cook. My father was a great cook. Uh, I should say, he still is a great cook. He's still alive. And growing up, I remember him buying these, and I still see them in uh, supermarkets that I go to. And they, these are these $5, $7 knives from Chinese supermarkets. I'm sure if you guys have gone to an Asian supermarket and you guys go through their cutlery aisle, you'll know what I'm talking about. They have butcher knives, slicers. Uh, they don't sell gyozos. Chinese either use uh, very thin slicers or big butcher knives, okay? And so my dad would, uh, I remember him, him, him having, I remember him having these, uh, these diamond ceramic or diamond uh, cheap whetstones and they sat underneath the sink and he had two of them one was black and one was brown and uh the black one was a really coarse one the brown one was a little bit finer i remember him taking them out and before every cooking session he would take his his knife and he would just do these single single strokes on this stone and i i'm even to this day you know 30 plus years later I can remember vividly him holding the stone and just doing this. And he's, you know, doing a single edge, single edge strop on a rough core stone. And uh, so that was my first, that's my first memory of what knives were in my, in my life. And, you know, fast forward a few years later, oh, 30, oh, 30 years later, I was researching for for knives for my own personal use, and that's really where it kind of re-sparked a lot of things. And so, um, I love quality. Uh, I don't like buying lots of stuff. I like to buy very few things that are good quality. So, yeah. So when I started researching knives, I 
when I, and also I'm a researcher, you know, when I get into something, I really get into something. So I, I would, I can spend months uh, and hours, hours a day at a time researching a single topic. And so at this point I was researching knives. And so the reason I started a channel uh, was kind of a few things uh, that actually prompted that. So I was finding a lot of, I, w I, w I went to the forums, uh, so I would go in forums and see what people were saying about certain knives and certain whetstones, and I would run into this issue where you find really the same dozen people on all the forums preaching the same thing, right? They would say, oh, based on this website, uh, based on this knife reviewer, this stone is the best, or based on so-and-so, I wouldn't recommend you buying this stone because uh, this person had, ba had a bad experience, and so I think all their brands uh, or all these stones from that brand are, are terrible. And I was seeing the same thing over and over. And so I was seeing this hierarchy, right, on, on the web of a, a couple of people who claim to be the authority because they, own a re oh, because they own a retail store. And so just because they own a retail store, they automatically know everything about knives and whetstones. And then you have their, their minions uh, be, below them that preach everything they preach to everyone else. And so I got really tired of that. So I went out and bought a dozen stones for myself and I bought about a half a dozen Japanese uh, Gyotos. And I started sharpening them and all I did was start filming them. Um, that's on my old channel, Ricky Tran. So I'll post a link to that channel if you guys wanna check them out. Uh, the videos are still there. They're actually quite old. Well, they're a couple of years, a year and a half old now. And I haven't updated that channel because I'm, I'm actually creating, re reviving that channel to a food channel. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. If you guys are interested in food, make sure you guys are subscribed to that channel because it'll be uh, different than what you guys see here. Uh, so anyways, so I I started posting those videos online and as, as I'm sharpening these things, I'm talking about them. And I never intended the channel to be a knife channel. It was really just a Ricky Tran hobby channel. Uh, I was putting knife content on that channel. I was putting cycling content. I was putting, putting camera content because I was I'm a big uh, hobbyist when it comes to photography and video. So, and then that channel kind of grew. It grew to, I don't know, I, I want to say about 3,000 subscribers in the first six months. And then I just, I stopped because I started traveling with my family. We took a five week vacation in Australia, uh, New Zealand, and Fiji. And in the, in the, in the, in the five weeks that we were away, uh, and in the six months after that, I didn't do anything on that channel. The channel grew another two or 3,000 subscribers. So I thought, you know, maybe people are looking for this content that I was putting up, that I was really just doing for fun. And so that's why I created a channel uh, dedicated to knives, which is this channel right here, Perfection. And in the first three months, we, uh, we got, um, I wanna say 8,000 subscribers. And uh, so it grew like, two or three times faster than my first channel, or maybe even more than that. And yeah, and so that's what it is today. And as the channel was growing, uh, I, I got a lot of people reaching out to me, asking me to review more knives and more whetstones. And so I started reaching out to companies, asking them for more more product. And that's kind of how it all started. So it, it kind of became, or, uh, it was very or organic. Uh, I never set out to start a knife channel. Uh, my Perfection is really kind of a culmination of my curiosity and whetstones and knives and my passion about learning and about experiencing and trying new things. And that's really what it's all about. And, uh, you know, so in terms of my, my experience, my professional experience in knives, I don't have any background in the restaurant business. Though my, 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 my wife, though my mother actually opened two restaurants when I was a teenager, uh, both restaurants failed, and I was a dishwasher in those restaurants. This is all I did, okay? So I am a very good dishwasher. I can probably start a channel on how to wash dishes and pots, and it would be very successful. Um, sharpening, though, I have a... I do have a background in sharpening, uh, and so let me just tell you guys what it is while I'm looking for something that I need to show you guys. Okay, here it is. This is what I was looking for. They were sitting off to the side... So I am a, uh, I was at one point in my life, a short track speed skater. Okay. So that was my, that was, this is, if I have to give you a time in my life where sharpening really was important in my life, not just because I loved it, it because I was actually trying to 
make an Olympic team, uh, it was then. So this was this was when sharpening meant everything to me. So these are speed skates, and uh, it's a carbon fiber boot. See, and this here is I believe a uh, I'll tell a little, how long is this blade here? This is a 17 inch blade. Okay, and so. I was a short track speed skater from 2002 to 2006. And uh, that was during my time when I was actually really competing. And so this is actually where my sharpening story begins. Uh, every day after we train or every day before we get on the ice, we'd have to sharpen our skates. And I was so methodical when it comes to sharpening my skates. Um, I will do a session for you guys and show you how speed skates are sharpened. And I don't have my jig. I actually gave away all my speed skating gear except my boots. Uh, so I had to borrow some speed skating gear at some point. So if any of my subscribers are speed skaters and you guys live in Los Angeles and you guys have a jig I can borrow, please hit me up in the comments. Uh, I can borrow your jig to demonstrate how we sharpen skates. But um, yeah, so every day before the ice or after the ice, I would sharpen my skates. And uh, the way you sharpen them is very particular and you have to be extremely careful because from where you're sitting, from where you're watching, this this blade looks straight. In actuality though, there is actually a radius on this cutting edge. So if I zoomed in uh, uh, you know, 50 times or 100 times, you would see an actual arc on this entire, running along this entire length of the blade. It's actually a radius, okay? And if you turn the blade this way along the front and back profile, there's actually a bend in the actual, uh, in the actual blade itself as well. So not only is this edge uh, or this blade here has a radius edge, there's actually a bend in it. So, uh, and I became really, really good at setting the bend and setting the edge uh, on on the cutting on the cutting edge, <laughs> on the skating edge. And so, before practice and after practice, I would spend about a half an hour sharpening my skates. And after about uh, who knows, uh, sharpening skates for teammates and, and uh, skate mates, I had a lot of a lot of people that were coming up to me and saying, "Hey, can you sharpen my skates as well?" Um, we heard you you know I heard you're really good could you put a bend in my in my skates can you make it a constant radius can you make a decreasing radius and so there were people that were coming to me that were much much better than me on the ice that were asking me to sharpen their skates and so every week I would sharpen about seven to a dozen pair of other skaters skates in addition to my own and so that's where I, I really developed the push and pull because you you sharpen these uh, you place it on a jig and you are pushing and pulling the entire time and, and so I got really good at sensing minute changes on the cutting edge and uh, on the stone. And so, yeah, that's really, I mean, so to answer your question, um, David, I have no experience in the restaurant in terms of cooking or prepping food, but my sharpening skills uh, were initially developed on the ice with sharpening speed skates. Okay, so I know that's kind of an, an un unorthodox way of going about it, but that's my story and uh, I'm sticking with it. So yeah, these are carbon fiber. These are actually uh, custom made. I have two pairs made, one for the ice and one for uh, the streets, an inline pair. And so they they, they weigh nothing, but uh, these things cost like $2,000 a pair. So this one boot here is over $1,000. So when you're competing at the Olympic level, uh, I never made the Olympics at all, but uh, I did attempt to. Um, I actually was in the 2010 Olympics in a very specific manner, which I will tell you in a different video. Um, it's gonna get too long to talk about in this video, but I will tell you at some point uh, of my 2010 uh, Winter Olympics experience. And uh, I think you guys will be kind of, it, it, it'll crack you up to hear about what my experience was. But yeah, um, so that's how I got into knife sharpening, as, or I, that's how my knife sharpening skills developed uh, because I actually sharpened speed skates. Yeah. All right, so let's go on here. Uh, this is by P. Munson. Hey there, P. All right, uh, so I'd be interested to learn how you became or how you came to transition from a fashion entrepreneur to a skilled knife sharpener. <laughs> oh man, this is, all these questions are really, um, they're great questions by the way, and I don't know how long this video is so far, but anyways, my videos always go over, over like an hour anyways. So, uh, <clears throat> all right, so as you guys may know, I did a video tour not long ago and I showed you guys all the jeans I had in store. Uh, I'm down to about half of that stock now, which is so nice. I had about 40 boxes of jeans here. Uh, 
yeah, maybe even more than that, but uh, it's so nice to have my studio cleared out. Oh, so there was really no, there, well, I shouldn't say there's no direct, uh, direct connection. So my jeans company failed uh, a couple of years ago, as you guys may know, and it was, uh, it was kind of a wake up call for me because in, up until that point, a lot of things that I actually did succeeded to some degree. And going, me going into jeans was not something that I was ready for. Uh, jeans is something I've loved growing up because growing up I was never really able to pair to a, a pair. You know, growing up I was never really able to afford really good jeans. I was always buying those uh, cheap ten, twenty dollar jeans growing up. And so when I became an adult and I was actually able to start my own company, I thought jeans was kind of a good thing to go into because it's something I've always loved. Uh, but to even kind of take a step back from that, uh, before I started my jeans company, I started a cycling company, and so or cycling custom wheel building company. So in 2000 and I want to say, well, actually it even goes even further than that, <laughs> further than that. So in 2002, when I started skating full time, uh, I was sharpening skates for a lot of different people, which I never charged people for. But what I was actually charging people for was uh, as a speed skater, I don't have anything here. Uh, as a speed skater, if you guys watch short track speed skating, you guys know that when they are turning around their the corners on the apex, they actually have their left hand on the ice. And so if you look very carefully, uh, speed skaters will have these tips on their fingers, on their gloves, that are made of either epoxy or carbon fiber or a some sort of uh, polymer resin. And so I actually started making tips for skaters and selling them uh, for just like $5 a pair of gloves or $20 a pair of gloves. So I would buy the glove or skaters would give me their gloves and I would make tips for them that's custom made for their hand. And so that was that was actually officially my first business. And so I did that for about four years while I skated. And so a lot of skaters that I skated with all came to me and said, hey, can you make me gloves? And so I would say, yeah, give me 20 bucks uh, and then give me your, your glove and then let me go measure your fingers and I'll make you tips for your gloves. So for four years, that's what I did while I skated. During those four years, I actually started, I uh, really got into cycling as well. So as a skater, cycling was kind of your downtime. So when the coach says, uh, you know, you have Sunday off, go for a three hour bike ride. <laughs> so you didn't really get a day off. You have to go for a three hour, four hour bike ride. And so I started building my own bikes. Uh, Cause if you, if you guys are into cycling, you guys know that bikes cost a lot of money. I mean, a good carbon fiber bike, will cost you at least $2,000. Uh, they're a little cheaper now because of the uh, you know, the technology of carbon fiber is so widespread. But when I first started cycling, carbon fiber was, was a big thing. And so a good carbon fiber bike would cost you $2,000. And then a good set of wheels would cost you at least $400 to $500. And so I didn't want to pay $400 to $500. Uh, and that's, that's on the cheap side. If you guys cycle, you guys know that good wheels will cost you $2,000. So I started piece uh, piecemealing different uh, wheel parts together. So I started buying wheels, uh, rims from one brand. I started buying hubs from somebody else. I started buying spokes from somebody else. And I started assembling wheels. And for about six months, I taught myself how to build wheels, uh, road bike wheels. And then after about the six month mark, I started posting uh, those wheels that I built, just photos of them online and on eBay. And then people started asking, hey, can you build me wheels? And then my teammates, again, my skate mates, or my biggest fans, right? So they came to me and said, hey, can you build a wheel for, for my bike? And six months go by, so a year go by at this point, and I'm, I'm selling wheels, I'm building wheels for my skate mates. And, uh, and then one day I got an email from a, a, pro, a pro cyclist in Belgium. Uh, so <laughs> and he said, hey, this is who I am. Uh, I want you to, to build me a set of wheels. And I, it was a $2,000 set of wheels, and I sent it to him. And, uh, and then on, on, all of a sudden on the forums, uh, my name was all over the forums. And uh, and so, so yeah, so then I said, you know, why not build a business from this hobby? And so I started a cycling, a wheel, a wheel building business for the next four or five years. And that kind of overlapped. And at the end of that, around 2007, 2008, I was kind of tired of building wheels because as much as I loved uh, building, well, actually, you know, it wasn't 2008, it was actually around... Uh, later, about 2010 or so, uh, I just kind of got tired because you know building wheels, it's 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 very relaxing, but your fingers get really tired. And when you're building six to uh, six to eight hours a day, and you're just cranking these little uh, wrenches, your fingers get tired. And so I said, you know, I mean, 
let me try something different. So that's when I thought, you know what, let's try a new business. And so that's when jeans came into my mind. <laughs> Stupid me, I had a very successful wheel building business uh, where I earned a great income uh, working from home uh, on my own schedule to working and to trying to uh, develop a brand of jeans that no one cared for because only my friends did. And uh, as much as, as good as the quality of my jeans were, it's just I couldn't compete with the the sevens and the true religions and uh, you know the Levi's and whatever else out there. Uh, a, a one man can't do it alone. And that's also my other mistake was I started a business thinking that it's going to be no different from my glove business, no different from my wheel business, where I myself can do everything. And in jeans, you have to deal with your factories, uh, your you have to deal with fabric vendors, thread vendors, zipper vendors, your dye houses, your wash houses, I mean, your sewers, your cutters, and these are like, and every one of them are a completely different industry, right? Or a different, yeah, a different facet of the industry. Uh, I alone cannot handle all of that. And so I brought on a partner, my partner, uh, you know, God bless him, I love the guy. Christian, if you're watching this video, I hope you're well. Uh, we haven't talked in a while, but he had some some issues that uh, have kind of made him disappear. I don't know where the guy is, uh, my old partner. So anyways, the, the business just didn't survive. And, you know, uh, a year, year and a half, two years later, when I was a, a dad, uh, so uh, I became a dad. And uh, so it's kind of a long story. Uh, I know, I became a dad. And uh, so right after when the jeans, the, so when the jeans business failed, uh, it happened at the same time when I, I thought, you know, I need to stop traveling because my wife is pregnant and my daughter is coming soon. And so I decided to end my career as a traveling, uh, really a product rep for Subaru at the time. And uh, I was researching knives. So it kind of all happened, uh, you know, it, even even though it happened all at the same time, they were very segmented. Uh, so the jeans business never led directly to my my YouTube channel. Uh, it just kind of happened at the same, it kind of ended at the same time when my YouTube channel kind of was starting because I was researching on my own. So I hope, I know that's a really, really long story of, of <laughs> my, my transition from gloves, uh, speed skating gloves, to cycling wheels, to jeans, to product rep, to a YouTube channel. Okay, I know I know that's really really long. It's probably very confusing, and I'm trying to cram everything into a you know a short answer. Uh, maybe I should do a, probably a, a video just on that sec, uh, that topic alone. But that's basically what happened. Uh, I was never. My intention when I started Ricky Tran, the original channel, was never to make it a knife channel. It just became a knife channel because the knife content got really popular and then the knife subscribers were asking for their own channel and that's where perfection came okay so it's basically to answer your question it was from one passion or uh, to one hobby to passion to another right so hobby of making gloves to the passion of building wheels to the passion of wanting to make good jeans to the research of good knives to really the passion of sharpening and uh, researching knives and whetstones Okay, P, I hope that's okay. Sorry for the long, 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 long answer. Uh, okay, so this is by uh, Joker B, or Joker B. Okay, I remember a while back hearing that magnetic knife strips were somehow bad for the constitution of the edge. It doesn't make a lot of sense when you consider it, but anyone know where it came from and whether or not there's anything there. So let me grab a magnetic knife strip, a knife strip and uh, discuss it while we are discussing knife strips. All right, so this is a, I believe a walnut. Yeah, it's a, I'm pretty sure it's a walnut. Very nice. So this is a walnut knife strip by Whitsum. Uh, they've sent to me by courtesy of Cutlery and More. So thank you again, Cutlery and More. So this is what you guys are thinking about when the, when knife strips are talked about. So they either come in steel wood or sometimes even leather those are really nice or some people use reclaimed wood okay so the question is are these bad for your knives hmm in my experience uh, i would say the answer is no 
However, there is a there is a small detail that you need to understand. If you are using a really cheap knife, let's say you know you guys saw me sh trying to sharpen the world's worst knife, which I named uh, uh, the MSE, the Martha Stewart Essentials. I don't know what or Martha Stewart knives. Those are the worst knives I have ever used in my studio. So that knife, what was happening with that knife was as I was sharpening that knife, the knife was collecting a lot of debris on the cutting edge as I'm sharpening it. So I could never identify the burr. I couldn't really see the burr. I had to constantly pull the cutting edge on a piece of wood to draw the burr out and pull all that material off. So when you have a cheaper knife that has been magnetized on a piece of, whether it's a piece of wood or just by, uh, who knows how knives get magnetized. I don't really know the science behind that, but really cheap knives can be magnetized and so it can it can affect the way the slur and the swarf collects on the cutting edge, but being magnetized will not affect the actual heat treatment of the knife. The only reason, the only way you can really that I can think of, uh, if you really want to destroy a knife, is by heating it up uh, higher than it's you know the higher than a certain temperature. Let's say I don't know 200 degrees or 300 degrees, and then cooling it down really fast. So you can change the heat treatment, right? So. If you're, using, if you're just using it on a magnet, it really won't change the constitution of the blade. It will, uh, it will just make it more difficult to sharpen as you're sharpening it. But in terms of actually making the knife worse, no. These don't make your knives less sharp or more sharp if you use it. Um, they can possibly magnetize your knife at a very, very minor level, but that just because your food is magnetized, it won't be a problem because you're cutting food, you're not cutting into metal. The answer to the question is no, your knife will not be ruined and you won't change the constitution of your blade. Uh, all it can do is make your sharpening a little bit more difficult if you have a cheaper knife that gets uh, very magnetized and the, uh, again, I, the, all the magnetic, all the metal shavings that come off of the edge will tend to cling onto the edge and it just makes it really difficult to feel for the burr and see what's happening on your cutting edge. But no, uh, a magnet strip will not hurt your knife at all. All right, so this is by Tommy Nguyen. Hello, I have been watching your video for a while and I have learned a lot of sharpening, but question about maintain. They came at maintenance, okay, or maintaining. Okay, I uh, recently bought a Miyabi Mizu 8, uh, eight inch chef knife, uh, good for you. I was wondering if what is the best way to maintain it from the wood handle? Uh, how do you, how to do mirror polish and knife? <laughs> okay, so let's let's do the first thing. Let's uh, how to maintain the wood handle? Um, let me grab a jar. Or something. Let me grab something and I'll show you guys what I do with my knives. Okay, so this is my DIY homemade wood polish. Okay, or wood finish. Uh, it's made of three ingredients. The uh, first part is uh, one part or in volume. So uh, one part linseed oil, raw linseed oil, while one part mineral spirits and one part varnish or salad bowl dressing. And you can mix it any volume you want at different different ratios to change the, the darkness or the, d the depthness of the color or how well it seeps into the wood. You can change all those ingredients yourself. So this here is what I use for all my wood handles that have no finish on them. So my Masamoto KS, I have used it on that handle. And I haven't used it on, it on any of my other knives because they actually have uh, pretty good finishes. And I also use it on my chairs for my home as well and my bench. And so this here creates a really nice seal if you apply about three coats. I found that uh, with this particular formula, three coats uh, of application gives it a pretty much a waterproof formula. And so I will post a video or link to the video um, how I actually made it, and you guys can actually see the finish that actually was produced from uh, from using this too. So this is how you, you know, this would give you a pretty much a waterproof finish. Um, the only drawback from this particular uh, formula is it can take if you have an, if you apply too many th layers of this stuff, it will become just a hard plastic around your wooden handle, and you will lose the you know the touch, that softness of the wood. So you may not want that. So if you guys have a wood that's really porous, just do one one application at a time and then feel for it. So it takes about 24 hours to cure. So you apply one coat, let it sit for 24 hours, do a really, really quick coat of uh, or light sanding and see how it feels. If you like it, keep it. If not, apply another coat. 
Um, but I have found that anything beyond three, it gets just too too hard, and you lose that uh, that really organic feel of the wood. And in terms of how to keep your uh, maintaining your mirror polish, how to do mirror polish on knife is you get a really high grit stone. You know, get a 8,000, 10,000 grit stone and you polish it that way. Two other methods you can use, you can use, this is a little bit more, this takes a little more time, but you definitely can do it. You can get something like a 3M a one micron or a 0.3 micron um, sharpening film. You can actually put this on a, um, on a glass, a plexiglass, or I put them on my, you know, I made these uh, atonement plates, uh, aluminum plates, actually stick them on that way. You can bring your knife that way. It actually will give you a mirror polish. Um, you can also use four knot steel wool. That actually does work pretty well. Uh, the only thing is it flakes, and uh, if you don't do it carefully, um, all those little flakes can actually just make it really dirty and uh, kind of kind of dangerous to breathe in. So just be careful with that. If you guys go that route. Uh, so yeah, really the easiest way is buy a good whetstone, a 8,000, 10,000 grit whetstone, and just you know, get your knife uh, clean that way. But I'm, also, I'm assuming you are talking about the sides of the knife, not the cutting edge. If it's a cutting edge, just go for a high grit whetstone. But if you're talking about the sides and the profile of the knife, then use either a steel wool or some really high, you know, really, really fine uh, 16 grit or 16,000 grit or 80,000 grit sandpaper and you can polish it that way. Oops. <laughs> Okay, so um, and how do you? And so the the next part of the question is how do you keep it sharp on a day to day basis? Um, so now that I have three kids to care for and my wife, I do not have the time to strop or sharpen my knives every single morning anymore. Uh, so let me just put this away really quickly. So back when I was uh, back when I was when it's just me and my wife at home, I had all the time in the world to wake in the morning. Uh, and spend five ten minutes on the stone and just clean my clean my knives off. I typically would just grab a a six thousand if I wanted to either a six thousand or a three thousand grit stone and I'll just sharpen just do a really quick either a sharpening set or a polishing session on the stone or really just some quick strops like 20, 20 strokes on each side and I'm done. Uh, but now that I have a family of uh, three kids, a dog and a wife to watch after I don't have that time anymore so I sharpen my knives roughly every two weeks now and I don't I don't strop my knives in between I don't uh, hone my knives with the rod in between uh, those days as well so basically every other week I would bring my knives into the kitchen or from the kitchen into my studio swap them out and sharpen the knives that I've just used and then the newly sharpened knives will be in my kitchen for about one or two weeks and so that's kind of how how I maintain my knives but if you have a Japanese knife with a rating of a heat treat rating of 60 and above, you really don't need to do anything to that knife unless you're using it in a professional kitchen where you're chopping different types of food all the time and you guys are just putting that knife to the really to the grind for six to eight hours a day. Then yes, if that's if that's you, uh, you may want to have either a strop there, just run once a day or twice a day uh, at the beginning of your shift and then mid shift. Um, or if you have a ceramic rod, I would recommend you have a ceramic rod if you have anything lower than a uh, 60 on the Rockwell scale. So if your knife is lower on the 60, the ceramic rod will actually work pretty well for you. But anything higher than 60, you're probably, you're probably better off either on a 3,000, 6,000 grit whetstone just sitting there that you would just polish once a day, twice a, uh, once a day should be good for the polish. And on the strop, just do it once a day or twice a day. I think that would be pretty good for you. Um, okay, so uh, after every time that I have used my knife, I would strop it on a leather strop with a one micron diamond honing spray. Perfect. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're, you're doing more than what's needed, but that's fine. And uh, do you think it's the best way to keep my knife razor sharp or is there something else I can add to my routine? Again, I'm speaking from a very practical person standpoint that is just dying for time <laughs> so what you're doing is more than enough it's probably more than 99 percent of people out there who are knife enthusiasts so yeah just don't don't even worry about it what you're doing now if you have the time to do stropping with one micron diamond paste every day uh you are yeah you are worlds ahead of everybody else so just keep doing what you're doing 
and don't worry about it. Uh, this one was actually written by a person. Uh, it was a private message, so I won't tell the name. So, oh, actually, it says, oh, my, name is, uh, my name is Justin. <laughs> uh, fan of your videos. Uh, I'm a cook by profession, and finally, after using and abusing other people's knives for so long, I've purchased my very own Masamoto HC Gyoto. So HC is their high carbon Gyoto, which actually is a very, really nice knife, and a very great knife. So seeing that you're a Masamoto guy and a knife guy in general, I was hoping you can answer a quick question about maintenance in the kitchen. Uh, I know it's up for debate on whether it is okay to hone a Japanese uh, knife, especially one as hard as uh, HC, as 61 HRC, on a steel or even a ceramic. So I just, I just answered this in the last question, so I'll leave that. Um, so yeah, light stropping is great. It's all you need. Uh, just do light stropping once a day or once every other day. You will be more than more than good. Uh, it will not fatigue the steel. So here's the other debate that you guys will see a lot is when you strop on a or when you hone on a rod, a steel rod, ceramic rod, or a titanium rod, you're bending. You're, you actually are at a, at a relatively microscopic level. You are actually bending the the teeth back and forth, right? So yes, you are fatiguing that those teeth there. On a strop, you are not trying to bend anything. You are pulling material off of the actual polished edge. Okay, so. The idea of a strop is your edge should already be polished and sharpened to a very fine point, very fine point. And so you are pulling off just micro materials from that cutting edge. And so you're not trying to bend anything. So if you are stropping and you are looking to strop on a leather strop or a, um, a whetstone, a high polished whetstone, you are technically not fatiguing that steel. You are really just pulling off um, materials from that surface okay so don't have to worry about it if you are if you're looking to do something like this um, you will not fatigue your steel at all okay and also uh, oiling high carbon steel uh, I have food grade mineral oil I was considering giving the knife a little bit after each shift yes that is actually perfect so what you do is um, what I, I still do this on my own time um, so I have a little cloth actually I keep a container of mineral oil in my closet next to the kitchen and uh, once every two three days I actually will wipe the knife down if I'm actually feeling really really good I'll wipe it down every night before I go to bed and so what that does is it still will allow a patina to form but much much slower than if you were to leave it um, kind of just washed and naked without any oil on it so the knife will still form a patina over time it will probably be reduced down to maybe one tenth of the time it takes to actually produce a patina uh, without you doing that okay so just be aware that uh, a, mineral, a mineral oil will help but as you're cutting onions as you're cutting uh, i think you are a professional chef um, by trade so as you are prepping in the kitchen as you're cutting vegetables meats your patina will fo will slowly form over basically with every cut that you make so when you apply a mineral oil at the end of it at the end of the day you still have all those cuts that you that you did that you made and so your knife will just form a patina at a much, much slower rate. And actually, because you're doing that, it will form a patina at a much more stable rate as well. So your patina will be much uh, less uh, harmful to the knife than if you were to just use a knife, uh, sharp, you know, wash a knife with water, and just let it sit in, in the, your cabinet or something like that. So yeah, so what you're doing, what you're thinking of doing is actually a really good thing. And that's what I do personally as well. All right, so this is by George uh, Kadadu. Did I pronounce that right? Hopefully I did. I'm sorry. So, hey, Ricky, just one quick part of my ignorance. Uh, you did an episode a little while ago uh, where you accidentally soaked a King 1000, 6000. Oh, so there's actually a number of questions here by kind of the same question. This seems to be an issue with a lot of people, uh, and they prove to be somewhat useless. Are these stones reusable, or are they only good for the bin? Okay, and then the next question, there's three of them in, in kind of the same category here. So this is by Argumido, Arg Sergio. Okay, Sergio Argumido. Oh, Argumendo, yeah, Argument, Ar Argumendo, sorry. My eye, I'm, it's, I'm kind of blind right now. Uh, just got some Tido professional stones, and I saw some videos that says they, they crack. Okay, do you have any experience with this 
And how do you dry your stones? Thanks. Hmm. I don't know what stones you're talking about. But I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I've had a couple of questions similar to this, and it's referring to the Chorsera Professional or the Chorsera stones. And so I'll answer that question as well. So this is another thing about uh, soaking. So, um, dear Tran, how do we undo the damage done by over soaking? I have made a mistake. And 6,000 side of my kingstone. Again, kingstones are always getting damaged. I uh, appreciate the advice. Okay, so I did a video a little while back on my Ricky Tran channel where I accidentally left my kingstone overnight, my King KDS. So the King KDS is actually very different from the KW65. Uh, this stone here, I have not over soaked it, so I don't really know what it's going to behave like. But from my experience, about 12 years back when I was still shopping skates, I actually bought a Kingstone. It was 1000 Kingstone before it was the deluxe Kingstone. I left it overnight and when I pulled that stone out the next morning, it literally was like clay. I held the stone up and the stone actually bowed on each side. <laughs> it destroyed the stone. So I suspect that if this stone was soaked overnight, it may have the same result. The KDS model, which is actually formulated from the deluxe King uh, 1000 grit stone and the S1 and S2 and S3 6000 side. It's a professional grade stone, so it's a much higher quality stone. When I soaked that stone overnight, the stone was still intact the next morning, but the stone was not sharpening on either side. It took, yeah, it literally took forever to for the 1000 side to produce an edge, and the 6000 side it became really sticky, and uh, the knife just didn't didn't move on the stone. I left the stone to dry for about a week. So I left it a week on its side. Uh, and after a week, I re-soaked the stone and it actually worked perfectly normal. So you don't have to worry about your stone dying after you have over-soaked it. You just leave it uh, standing on its side. Or actually, if you want to, to even be safer, is you find an edge uh, or a surface and you let the stone sit at an angle. So that way there is essentially no more than uh, you know, a millimeter of stone is actually in contact with any surface. That way, air can get completely through um, the entire stone. So that's how I would dry your stone if you were to accidentally soak it overnight. Um, how I store my stone. So after a sharpening session on any of my stones, whether it's a soaking stone or a non-soaking stone, I actually set the, the stone on its side on my shelf, which I have right next to me here. So they sit here uh, for until the next time I use it. And if it's a glass stone, which they're very thin, they cannot stand this way. The glass stones, I lay this way. So that's how the glass stones are sitting on my shelf right now. So that way I get all of the surface that I need aired out and they are not, uh, nothing's laying flat. And also glass stones, because they are flat uh, and they're glass on one side, you actually can leave it on the glass side. But because my bookshelf is actually kind of narrow, I have them sitting this way to save space. But if you have a glass stone, you can just let it sit this way with the ceramic sides uh, facing up. Okay. Um, ba -ba -ba. Let's see here. So another couple of questions here. Uh, can you do sharpening on sandpaper? Um, I have. I just posted a video a couple of weeks ago of me sharpening the Kritz, uh, Kritzke on sandpaper. Uh, it, The sandpaper held together only long enough to have the knife sharpened. If you guys want to use sandpaper, you're better off using the 3M's uh, sharpening film. I'll post a link to where you can buy this. This here costs the same price as sandpaper, but will last much, much longer. Um, let me grab something really quickly here. All right, so these are my DIY plates. Uh, I actually made these sharpening plates a little while back. I showed you guys a video of them, and they, the edge that was produced on these were amazing, like absolutely incredible. So this, um, so let's go with the course. So the course, um, the course plates here. I've had right now up to six sharpenings on them, and I think they can last another couple. Okay, so um, bear in mind, I'm sharpening knives that are rated from well 55 to about. Uh, actually as high as 63 at this point so they are getting probably sh um, beat up more than most people I don't know how many people will, will be sharpening their knives uh, with heat treatments of 63 on these on these um, sheets here but you can um, so uh, both these here on both sides the 40 micron and the 50 micron have had uh, a number of uh, six sharpenings on each of them and I think they have about two more sharpenings um, of life in them 
The polishing sheets, however, will last, I think, much, much longer. Um, because you are not applying anywhere near the amount of pressure um, that you would apply on the coarse sheets, I think these will last at least two, at least a dozen times, um, at least a dozen times, in my opinion. So these, again, these each have about six sharpening sessions on them, and they still feel like they were when they were brand new. And again, it really, your mileage will vary depending on how hard you press, uh, what kind of knife you're sharpening, and just your overall technique and what type of technique you actually are using on these plates. But instead of buying sandpaper, going back to the question by Maxime, you're better off buying these sheets because these sheets here come in, um, they come in eight by 10 sheets. Let me show them to you. So these come in eight by 10 sheets and I cut them into threes to fit my plates that I made. And, um, and they last a lot, lot longer than sandpaper because they were formulated for sharpening. And that's that's why I would recommend these. And they cost the same. Each sheet will cost about two fifty plus shipping, so you're looking about three fifty per sheet. Um, you go buy three and sandpaper. Uh, four sheets will cost you seven to eight dollars at the local hardware store. So they cost the same, uh, maybe a dollar more, or yeah, maybe a dollar more per sheet, uh, or a dollar less depending on what type of sheets you buy. You know, what kind of you know sandpaper? I have sandpaper here that cost like $5 per sheet, <laughs> okay? So yeah, uh, so you're better off using a sharpening film, which is actually formulated for sharpening. Uh, it'll last you much longer and you will get much better results as well. Okay. Mm, and I'll post a link of the sharpening on sandpaper in case you missed it. I'll post a card or a card here to that video or a link in the description. Okay, so... Um, I don't know how long this video is. It's getting kind of long. I'm sure it is, uh, but that's okay. All you diehard fans are there. I love you. Thank you. Mm, okay, so this is a question about is uh, by Ahmed. So Ahmed asks a question. Uh, Hi, Ricky. Is is it is it stropping with leather is necessary to get razor sharp edge? So is stropping with leather necessary the answer is no it is not as you guys uh, again going back to my brick video it is the cheapest thing i have in my studio or in my home it's a brick i found in my backyard and it produced an edge that i think is very very good uh, so if i threw it if i combined the brick and this little strap say for a combined price of 30 30 bucks or so um I can have an edge that will fool anybody that I can tell them that was sharpened on, you know, $400 worth of stones. Okay. So the answer is no, Ahmed, you don't need a leather strop to produce a really good edge, but if you really want to have a, a good edge, a leather strop is probably not a bad idea. Uh, if you guys watch any of my, sh my sharpening videos, uh, either my tutorials or just my sharpening sessions uh, in the playlist, I produce good edges from 120 grit stones to 300 grit stones that can, uh, can cut really really well okay so the quick, uh, the, you know, quick answer is no you don't need to have anything fancy in your arsenal of sharpening stones and sharpening accessories it really comes down to technique if your technique is consistent and it's good uh, the key word is consistent if your if your technique is consistent you will produce very good edges okay all right, so I've had a number of questions like this. Uh, so this is by Delinea. That's a cool name, Delinea. Uh, love your videos. You are so honest and straightforward and easy going with your tutorials. Uh, thank you, Delinea. Uh, okay, I really want to have a, sh a knife sharpening tutorial channel like yours. Okay, you want to have your own YouTube channel. Uh, I don't think you. I don't think there are any women doing videos like this on YouTube. Uh, any advice for a woman who is about to start a YouTube career with knives? Okay, how do I get review samples? Uh, so this is a bunch of questions here. Uh, how do I? How do you set your studio for filming? Can I? Uh, can I give? Uh, can you give us a studio tour? Uh, please keep up the uh, great work, and maybe one day we can do a collaboration video together, or uh, collaboration videos together. Okay. Uh, so this is a YouTube uh, career question. I get these a lot these days. <laughs> um, so good on you, Delinea. Delinea, right? Uh, make sure I'm not blind again. Okay, so Delinea, thank you for watching my videos and thank you for the question. Um, 
YouTube is a great platform for anything, okay? And, uh, you know, so first I want to just kind of lay this out there. Don't, don't segment yourself as a woman doing anything because uh, women can do anything just as good as men can. Okay, I will say that right. I, I will say that out loud. I was raised by a single mom. She ran a business while raising three kids on her own. So I have every respect for any woman who is trying to do uh, any sort of work, uh, whether you're raising a family or not. Okay, so don't differentiate yourself by sex. Uh, it all comes down to your drive and your skill and your passion, and motivation. So okay, so take the woman out of the YouTube channel part. Um, do I have any advice for you? Uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, so the first thing I would say is focus on your content. Okay. Your content, if your content is good, people are going to watch it. Okay. So, and, and it takes time to build your audience. You know, it took this, well, my channel took a few months to get to, it took, I, where I am today, uh, at the posting of this video, I have, I think, 15,000 subscribers and my channel has been active for six months, okay? So um, not everyone's going to have the same level of success and some people will have more success than that. So every channel is going to grow at its own rate. Uh, your audience will be based on what your content is is uh, providing. So if your content is a review channel, that's great. Just do reviews. Um, don't try to emulate anyone else. That's the key thing is... Don't try to be like my channel. Don't try to be like the popular channel that you are watching. Um, your content needs to be specific to who you are. It needs to be true to what you're trying to convey. Um, and if you are producing content and you're copying content or you're kind of remaking content from somebody else, your subscribers or your potential subscribers will see through it. Okay, the People aren't dumb. People will see if you are being genuine about what you're producing and they... Is there a spider on me? There's like a little something squat. <laughs> I have lots of spiders in this studio. So yeah, yeah sorry about that. Um, I'm not afraid of spiders. It was just, it was just crawling. I felt something crawling on my neck. So your content needs to be very consistent. Uh, and also keep in mind, if you are looking to do a YouTube channel, okay, you said channel, right? Channel, channel, yes. Right, so a, a YouTube career, okay? So you use the word YouTube career. So with my channel, it was a hobby. It still is a hobby because I'm not getting paid by YouTube. Um, I haven't taken on any sponsorship on my channel. So it still really is just a hobby. Uh, it's a growing hobby. The channel is getting big and it's getting bigger. I shouldn't say big, it's getting bigger. And a lot of people watch my videos on a weekly basis and I am putting out content when I can on a weekly basis. So if you are gonna put out a channel specifically targeting, uh, in this case, a knife channel, make sure that you are consistent with your channel uh, with every week. So if you can produce a video once a week, that would be that would be very, very good for your audience. Um, not absolutely necessary, but very good for that uh, because people tend to kind of lose track of your channel if you don't have content coming out every week or so. Uh, and also just ignore the trolls. There are trolls everywhere. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of hate messages I've gotten from my channel uh, or on my channel, on my comments. I mean, I've gotten so many bad comments that I just don't want to mention. I'm not even going to post them on this on screen so you guys can see them. It's just, they're disgusting. Uh, there are a lot of people who are out there just who, uh, they want to be heard and they are miserable with their lives and they hate what they are living every day. So they go online, they go behind a screen and they just project that hate and project that anger onto somebody else. And so... Uh, more than anything else, I want you to keep in mind to not be discouraged by trolls because that's all they are. Uh, don't feed the trolls. Don't respond to their messages. Just delete them. Uh, you don't need them, okay? And uh, my channel, at, at its current size, I get about, I want to say, two to three dozen hate messages a week, okay? And that may not sound like a lot, but when you, and if you're like me, and I read through every one of my comments, I see them <laughs> all the time. And they're the ones that kind of stick out at you, right? You know, they say that in, in, that, in that psychology experiment where you see a, f a room full of, or a, a picture full of smiles and there's one frown, you automatically can see the frown. It's kind of like that. So when you have all these great messages from people and they say, hey, your channel has, hel has helped me so much in my knife sharpening. You've made my knives so much sharper, sharper than uh, they've ever been. And then you see like, one comment that says, you know, your content is crap. You are a piece of POS. Uh, your eyes look funny, whatever it is those comments stick out and so it took me a little while to kind of over 
uh, overlook those comments and to ignore them. But they will come uh, if you got if you decide to do this, and especially in the knife world where it's male dominant, right? I mean, that's just some that's kind of kind of the nature of this of this channel is it's male dominant. And uh, I look at my analytics. My uh, my demographic is ninety eight percent men. So <laughs> that's just it's 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 just how it is. I mean, I mean, there's no going around it. Uh, I'm not going to try to change my channel up to kind of cater to women. Um, because uh, I may not reach because maybe women don't want to see me talk about content that is more woman centric. Okay, so I'm just talking. Uh, I do things that I'm interested in and what my readers ask me to do. So, or, or ask I do what my readers ask me to review. So that's kind of how I base my content on um, on what to produce every week. So for you again, uh, ignore the trolls. Uh, be consistent with what you produce and uh, have a clear vision of what you, you want your channel to be, right? And if, if you have those things down, it should help you a lot. And uh, yeah, I mean, I wish you the best of luck. Do drop me a line whenever you have any questions about your YouTube channel. Um, I've already given a tour of my, of my channel, so I will leave a link in the description and also post a link here if you guys want to see my video tour or Delinea if you want to see my tour. Of my video see how i rig up my cameras see what cameras i use what equipment i use um, i'll also leave a link in the description to my kit list to all the gear that i should use for my uh for my channel as well so um so again thank you for your comment and uh, it means a lot when people ask me for advice like this so uh it, it, yeah thank you so this is by buddha mac ba -ba 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 -ba. okay so um uh, Ricky, have you ever thought about designing your own set of knives? I have not. <laughs> well, sort of, but no, not really. Um, or maybe just a chef knife. Uh, with all the contacts uh, with companies you're getting, you might be able to get one of them to make a run of limited edition Ricky knives. Mm. Okay, so uh, this is something that has happened recently in my channel. So. When my channel hit that, um, when it broke the 10,000 subscriber mark, uh, when it broke, well, around the four or 5,000 subscriber mark, I had a couple of companies reach out to me and say, hey, would you help us design a knife? Uh, when it broke the 10,000 mark, there has been about three companies or so that have come to me and said, well, actually, there's been about a dozen companies that said, would you design a knife for us? But about three companies that have come on board and said, hey, you know, would you license Perfection and license Ricky Tran to my company or to our company so that we can make knives um, based on your your design, uh, your input. Uh, I have said no to all of those at this point. Uh, at this point, I, yeah, it's, I think it would be very profitable because they actually are offering a lot of money uh, and they have offered me con complete control of design, um, materials and, and aspects of the knives. I just I, I don't know I, I feel like I feel like my channel is not quite big enough for that yet you know I don't want to have another product launch and for it to launch prematurely and uh, you know that's the last thing you want is to think that you are bigger than you really are right and just because I have uh, between my two channels uh, 20,000 subscribers it doesn't mean that I'll have 20,000 buyers or 20,000 customers uh, that my potential customers at this point true but they're not 20,000 buyers right and so if a knife company launches a brand and they say all right we're hoping to sell 20,000 knives and I only sell like three or four hundred knives you know that may be considered a flop and you know so yes yeah, so to answer your question I would love to launch a line of knives and you get let me know I mean let me know in the comments if I launch a line of knives with my input uh, with my design um, would you guys be interested in buying it? I mean, just let me know. I'm not going to, again, this is to lay it out there. I have not taken up any offers from companies. I have not said yes to anybody to designing a knife. So uh, it's not even on the blueprint at this point. Okay. So it's not even on the radar. Um, I just want, I'm curious about what you guys would think if I were to launch my own line of knives, what you guys would actually be, will, uh, be willing to do. Would you guys buy a line of knives? And I know that even if you guys say yes, like, let's say 100 of you guys say yes only like maybe 10 of you guys will actually buy a knife <laughs> i'm pretty sure that's the case because uh that's kind of how economics works uh when when push comes to shove you know when you will you put your money where your mouth is a lot of people will back out 
But uh, so Budimac, uh, thank you for the compliment. Um, I have thought about it very briefly, but yeah, there ha there is about three offers on the table. Or there are about three offers on the table uh, of me to launch my own liner knives uh, with Perfection's name, and there are about another dozen companies that would like me to design knives for them. And I have said no to all of them, but uh, yeah, that may change. Who knows? But as of now, the answer is no. Okay, so this is from Knife Pro Sharpener. Oh, look at that. I have a subscriber that is a pro knife sharpener. Okay, so hey there. I'm uh, I'm very new to your channel, um, but have seen every one of your videos. Okay, question. I have noticed you do not have a Patreon account. Uh, where can where where you can create videos for people who contribute financially for exclusive con exclusive content. Uh, and do you uh, not offer the option for people to contribute on YouTube? Okay, why is that? So let me answer those questions first before I go on with the next. Um, oh, see, I is there a question? No more question. Okay, yeah, so no more questions. So I personally would love to uh, love to be monthly contributor simply because I want to support an amazing channel. I'm sure there are lots of people out there who feel the same. Uh, you are never pushy with your views uh, and all of your reviews are spot on. I personally do not want you to stop uh, doing videos and will contribute to make sure you can keep making, uh, keep, you can make videos forever. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you, Pro Knife Sharpener. <laughs> that's a cool name. I didn't know you could actually do that, but yeah, cool. Um, oh, so Patreon and YouTube. Um, I... Yeah, this goes back to kind of my pride, uh, I think, or, or my shyness. I'm, I'm a very shy guy, in case you guys don't realize that. Uh, me getting in front of the camera every week or every every couple times a week is actually really difficult. Um, it took me a long time to actually get this YouTube channel started. So, uh, so again, going back to the question, I have not um, opened a Patreon page. Um, I didn't know that... Well, I know that YouTube has a function, a feature that says uh, click yes for people to contribute. I, didn't, I don't know if they're actually the same as Patreon. I don't know if they're same. I, I really haven't looked into it yet. The, the Again, going back to really the previous question is, I don't know that my channel is big enough to support that. And I don't want to feel like, or I don't want to sound like another guy that says, hey, uh, fund me. Like, you know, all these people are, I'm getting f messages on Facebook all the, every day from friends and acquaintances uh, to go to their GoFundMe account so that I can pay for their college or I can pay for their, their down payment for a car or pay for their transition to a new job. And I just feel like, like I got, I'm being taken advantage of by these people. Like, hey, they're, all they're asking me is for their money, right? And so I don't want to feel like I'm doing the same thing to my subscribers. I don't want to put a video out and say, hey, by the way, guys, uh, I'm going to do my review. But if you guys want to see this review, you have to go to my Patreon page and pay a monthly uh, subscription fee. And to see this review, I just feel like what I present and what I'm putting out um, should be made public to everyone. And so I am a little conflicted about starting a Patreon channel or a YouTube channel uh, only for subscribers. Uh, Vimeo, I think all of Vimeo also has a feature like that. Um, so a number of people have actually asked me for that uh, or have asked me to create a, or hop on a platform where they can contribute. Uh, it's very noble. Thank you to you and thank you to everyone else who actually have reached out and actually have mentioned that. Uh, I just have a, a personal issue against doing that. I'm not saying that I will not do it uh, in the future. Maybe if I have content that is really cool or if I have things that I can offer that is very exclusive, then maybe I will consider that. Um, but at this point, I haven't really thought that far yet, um, mainly because, again, I wanted to make sure that I am genuine with what I'm doing uh, and as opposed to making this to a kind of a money-making scheme. Uh, I don't want it to be that. So I hope you guys understand that. Um, so. You know, thank you for everyone who are willing to contribute to my channel. Um, maybe if my channel gets a little bit bigger, maybe if I hit 50,000 or something or 100,000 subscribers, then I, I might do something like that where we do like, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I haven't really thought about it. But a couple of things have happened recently, though. Um, the distributor of uh, Masamoto, the dist distributor of Suhiro, um, Naniwa, and King have reached out to me recently. So... Um, they said that, you know, we would love to have our, our stones, um, 
<laughs> more publicly seen on your channel and would be willing to offer wholesale prices to you and your subscribers who want to buy our stones. So if I do launch a Patreon page or a YouTube, um, I guess a YouTube Red account, or I don't know, a YouTube paid channel account uh, where I offer, uh, where my subscribers can pay a monthly fee, um, if I offered you guys wholesale prices on those products, would you guys be interested? I and mean, that's something that I can probably, because I don't really want to ask you for money on a monthly basis just to offer you a video that I'm doing anyways. But if I can offer you a product, uh, like let's say a Chosera 3000 for let's say $90 when they retail for 180, right? Or 150, or 160, but I can get it to you for 90 bucks or, ni or 100 bucks to your door. I don't know what the number is. I'm just <laughs> kind of throwing it. I think the Chosera I can get for like $97 or something like that plus shipping. So, you know, if I can get you a stone that would normally cost you 150 or 180 shipped to your door for 110 uh, for the wholesale cost, and you guys be contributed to my channel, you know, that would be something I'm willing to offer because then I'm not just taking money from you. I'm actually offering you not just a service, but offering you like a product in exchange, right? So, you know, so if I did something like that, then I would be, but then I don't want to be a retailer either because I'm not a retailer. I have no interest in retail. I have no interest in, uh, you know, I am selling these blocks and these plates because I made them because I had to make uh, 50 of these to get the prices that I wanted. <laughs> and uh, and the manufacturer said you had to cut at least 50 plates for us to cut you plates. So I had to cut 50 plates. And these, I bought a, a big block of wood to cut them into these uh, blocks. So that's why I have them for sale. But I'm not a retailer, and I'm not going to be going back into the mindset of selling product. Uh, so I don't want to be a retailer. So um, if I can do, th if I can get a Patreon page without selling you a product, and I can just simply be the middleman to kind of help you transaction and get things like, you know, you really good whetstones for wholesale cost that you can't get anywhere else, then yeah, th I might be interested in that. But if you guys are interested in getting, you know, king whetstones, um, for example, I looked up the pricing recently. I can get you a King Whetstone, I think for $46 or f almost 50 bucks, um, shipped to your door. Yeah, shipped to your door for under $50 versus like 60 bucks plus shipping on most sites. So yeah, I mean, there are, there are benefits that I can probably offer you if I did start a Patreon page. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to just do it, just ask for money. Um, I just have an issue with that, but that's just me though. Um, let me know what you got, what your thoughts are, you know, so. Um, or if I'd say, hey, if I do line a lot, uh, if I do launch a line of knives, um, I'll offer my knives only to my Patreon or the first 300 to my Patreon people. Who knows? I mean, again, these questions, um, they get me to think about these things, but I'm not consciously going through the day thinking about how do I make more money on YouTube or how do I, how do I get my subscribers to send me money. You know, I'm not going through my days thinking about that. I'm thinking about how do I take care of my family? And then after that's taken care of, how do I produce a video that's entertaining to watch that's relevant for my subscribers? Yeah, that's kind of, kind of what, I, what I what I go through on a daily basis. But I think that's the last question. Uh, are there any more here? Mm, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. Um, but I don't know how long the video has been, but I'm sure it's quite long at this point. Um, yeah, so that is it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And um, again, the knife, I have three a three-digit number on this knife. It's three digits. So send me your comments. Let me know what you think those numbers are. Uh, and I will announce the winner on the next video after this week. Okay? So, um, so just so you guys are aware, I will announce a winner every Saturday. That makes it easy, okay? So the Tuesday videos are my sharpening videos where I'm not really talking to the audience. Well, I, I am talking to you, but uh, my main videos are gonna be released on Saturdays because that's all the time I have. And then my when my Tuesday videos or Tuesday, Wednesday videos will be either the unboxings or kind of shorter videos that are not as in-depth as my Saturday videos, okay? So that is it for this video. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sitting through another long video. Uh, I hope I hope that it was actually informative and that you guys learned a, few, a thing or two. Uh, learn at least a thing about me, my bracelets and my sharpening, how I started sharpening. Um, but I really appreciate the questions. Again, I will do these videos. Uh, I will try to do them more often, maybe once a month or once every other month. Uh, if you guys uh, want me to do more, just leave in the comments. Let me know you guys want more of these videos. And uh, thank you for watching again. Uh, how many times have I said, said thank you already? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll catch you guys in the next video.